Hi. Um, Hi. Some immunodeficient patients are recommended antibiotic prophylaxis, and I was wondering why those patients don't become overwhelmed with resistance bacteria, and, and why doctors choose to do that. Well, I think it's a choice between making the population. That's not, the problem is the rest of the population as well. So if you're immunocompromised and you're going to die if you don't have prophylactic antibiotics, I can fully sympathise with that. But I think if you if you take a high enough dose. I mean, the, the trick is, but it's a, it's a low dose for it's life. A low dose, yeah. Um, and for people who aren't necessarily really badly immune. Yeah, deficient. maybe that's not such a good idea. Yeah, but <laughs> this is this is a concept <laughs> called stewardship, which people are talking about now, which is how do we keep the antibiotics that we have working for a long enough time? And issues like this will be discussed at these these meetings. And I'm, I'm not a doctor again, but I think it's not a good idea to take a long, low dose of antibiotics. I mean, maybe a high dose would be better. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a gentleman at the back here. Thank you. With regard to the first question, without charging her for my opinion, she should make sure she's vaccinated against the pneumococcus. Now, people of my generation will remember a, a, a comedian called Kenneth Williams. And in a program called Around the Horn, he, he, uh, he used to use a phrase, I think the answer lies in the soil, which, you, which <laughs> nature only just discovered the other week. Can you use the techniques of, uh, uh, of 16S RNA analysis and 18S RNA analysis to look for these bacteria that you can't grow? You can see or, them, but how do you know that they're producing yes, what you and, need? But yes. analyze the, the uh, RNA there and, and see what it matches up to. And, um, and then what it doesn't match up to are presumably these non-growing organisms. Yes, obviously if you do advanced techniques to find bacteria that, that aren't viable in culture, you can find lots and lots of things. But the problem is then you have a huge data problem. I have friends who do this, um, a colleague of mine, and you're swamped with genomic data and you don't really know what it means. You don't know which of those are the good guys, which are the bad guys. You don't know which ones are the pathogens, which ones are the commensals. You've discovered 500 new bacteria, but you don't know what it means. So in some ways, it's good to have a, a phenotype, a, you know, a visual readout for what you're looking for. Just looking at the genes is sometimes not enough, but it is good to know what's out there. And these molecular techniques are very important, definitely. So we have a question on the other side now. Just, just, just here. Um, so I think you said at the beginning that we're partly symbiotic with bacteria. I, I'm not a scientist, I, didn't, I don't fully know this, but I, I remember reading in a New Yorker article recently, somebody said we're something like 10% human and 90% poo. So <laughs> therefore, when you take an antibiotic, why doesn't it kill you? Well, those bacteria, we don't need those bacteria to survive. We need those bacteria to feel good after a meal. So if you take a long course of antibiotics, you'll probably notice you get a bit ill, maybe get a bit of diarrhea, but it, it's not going to kill you because the bacteria are not keeping you alive. The antibiotics do not affect our mitochondria, the things inside us that are like bacteria. They're too different now. They've evolved. They're not susceptible to that, fortunately. The, that's the beauty of antibiotics, actually, was that it was such a magic bullet. It had so few side effects compared to other drugs. And, and that's why they were so amazing when they came out. Someone there, yep. Wow. Thank you. Why do the new antibiotics only work on gram-positives? Well, they actually used a gram-positive organism to screen. <laughs> they used Staph aureus because Staph aureus is a big problem. And obviously, we need antibiotics for both kinds. And that's the one they chose to publish. I assume in their laboratory in Boston. <laughs> They're busy doing gram-negatives and all sorts of other things. But that's what they chose to publish. And it was an easy one to look for because Staph aureus is a, is a nice organism. You really want to defend against that. It's a big problem in hospitals. Um, it if we were, I really enjoy your talk first. Thank you. Um, if we were theoretically to find a whole new way, of, I'm saying theoretically, a whole new way of stopping organisms, and we theoretically stopped using antibiotics for, I don't know, 100 years or something, and then after 100 years we came back and started using, for example, penicillin again, 
would they have forgotten it or could <laughs> could we use them again and then we could perpetually cycle or is, I or is think, that not well, possible? I think a difficult experiment to do, guess, isn't it? To, to monitor. <laughs> I think no, I think they won't forget because penicillin is ancient, as I mentioned, and so is the resistance to penicillin. It's been there all the time, we just found it. So I think, but you're right, if we used it better, they, it wouldn't be around so much and perhaps we would indeed. So let's do the experiment. <laughs> There's another question I think in the gallery. Um, Hi. Um, I was wondering what your personal opinion was on is basic on the basic sort of end of this. Um, if you if we kind of think of an analogy where there's uh, nuclear missiles going across the world between Cold War countries and a nuclear winter that basically kills everything. So what's the end with bacteria and like us fighting them? There won't be an end. I mean, the bubonic plague only killed 60% of Europe. <laughs> 40% of people survived. And actually, bacteria have been sculpting our gene pool for millennia by killing off the weak. It's true. I mean, in a way, you could say maybe the human race would, would be battered but would come out stronger. I don't think bacteria are going to make us extinct, because they would have done it already if they could. I think it's just going to be very unpleasant to be a human in the next 50 years if we don't come up with new alternatives. There was a question, I think, just the gentleman just there, thanks. Thank you for your talk. You're welcome. I'm not going to go home happy. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> but you said that actually we manage ourselves to kill off most of the things that attack us without the aid of, well, even the bubonic plague, 40% of us manage to. Is there a line of research that goes on to see how you get your immune system to attack these little blighters rather faster than they do at the moment? Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of research amongst immunologists who are very complicated people, as I mentioned. Yeah, there, obviously we need to understand the immune system better. We don't understand it very well. When I was in graduate school, there were only six kinds of cells. Now there's 25 kinds of cells. I'm trying to teach my students this stuff. It's changed rapidly in the past 20, 30 years, and, and we don't understand it all. And there should be ways, I mean, to going back to your question, there should be ways to boost immunity, but I'd rather have an antibiotic, personally. Um, yeah. Just, just want to just to wait for the microphone, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk, very interesting. Um, you touched on it very briefly, but where do you see the future of mining the sea going? Well, yeah, we've got Craig Venter sailing around in his happy ship. He's been pulling up, but it's really interesting that, what's the name of his ship? So, so, so I can't remember. He's in the Sargasso Sea. He's pulling up genomic sequences from bacteria in the oceans. I think if you could drop your petri dish into the ocean and do what these guys did, you'd probably isolate lots of new antibiotics that way. I think, going, as I said, going to the deserts. But the sea is really interesting because it's so vast and unexplored. And, and Venter's work has shown that there are, is an awful lot of bacteria down there doing interesting things that we know nothing about. So that would be a good area. Longitude prize. <laughs> I've just got one question, actually, before this. I know there's some more uh, hands in the audience. But you mentioned the role of pharma and um, uh, the prof profitability of these, of these of antibiotics. Because, as you said, they're not drugs that are taken every day for years, will they still be profitable, at the new ones, because they'll be in higher demand? Or, or I mean, what's the incentive? Yeah, well, you can imagine, if we get that far, <laughs> demand will rise <laughs> as we get sicker and sicker. But I think it's going to take um, incentivization. So we need the governments to help out pharma, give them tax breaks. You know, in the States, they're doing, um, they're extending their patent life. So, you know, 17 years isn't very long. By the time you're ready to go, you've only got three years left, and then it all goes generic in Canada. <laughs> so you can extend the patent life, give them a bit more time, and I think people will be using antibiotics more, and yeah. they will be in demand, but at the moment, it's not very profitable. Okay, thanks. I think I saw some, oh, quite a few hands, actually. Maybe gentleman over here first, and then, then there's one behind you. Given the unprecedented size of the human population and the ability of bacteria to adapt, do you think a decline in population is inevitable, or do you think we can maintain where we are now, or go, You're go asking, grow more. This is something, a question for Malthus, yeah. <laughs> um, for population biologists. I don't know. I mean, we are quite crowded. The more crowded we are, the easier it is to spread these resistance genes. And obviously, with the Ebola outbreak, the, the closer we are with other humans, the more infectious disease we have. The more we can spread it, the more we get it. So I don't know, really. I mean, we're quite clever. <laughs> and I think, that, I think the, the warning is finally getting out, hopefully not too late. 
And I have confidence that science can solve this problem if it's given enough money and enough consideration. I think we can solve the problem without suffering a mass extinction, at least I hope so.